Happy Sabbath, church family, and uh, anyone else watching as well, and uh, glad you could be with us. Today we're going to continue with our series on Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And to begin with, I have a question for you, <clears throat> and it's this. Have you ever met a false prophet? How did you know that he or she was false? Have you ever received a personal message from a false prophet? Over the years in ministry, I have on the rare occasion received personal messages from those who consider God was reproving me through their ministry to correct my theology. And whenever I receive such a, a message, I always do examine myself in the light of the reproofs or the admonitions to make sure that I am preaching what God's word actually says. A big clue that the one who sends the message is not of God, is that the message usually comes by in the form of an anonymous letter. Another clue that it's a false message is that most of the messages are very, very judgmental and contain personal attacks. Now, while I would suspect that many who send such messages, such testimonies, are defending some deeply held preconceived ideas, some presuppositions that have never, they've never challenged, they really are not helpful. And it's frustrating with anonymous letters that there's no opportunity for dialogue or for understanding, greater understanding. Continuing on then with our study of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus makes some warnings to gives us a warning. The Sermon on the Mount, of course, is found in Matthew's Gospel, chapters 5, 6 and 7. And uh, we see there that Jesus is in fact concerned with and even warns us about false prophets. Our sermon passage this week is Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 to 20. Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 to 20. I'll read it through in the uh, New Living Translation that I usually use. And uh, you can follow along in your translation. Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 to 20. And Jesus says this, verse 15. Beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep, but are really vicious wolves. You can identify them by their fruit, that is, by the way they act. Can you pick grapes from thorn bushes? Or figs from thistles? A good tree produces good fruit, and a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit, and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. Before we look closely at our sermon passage, there's a need to say something about prophets in general. The work of a prophet could include um, a direct message from God, could include a number of things. One, a direct message from God, and uh, that is relayed to the nation, and it's precisely what God commanded him to relay. 
In Deuteronomy 18:18, 18, 18, God said to Moses, I will raise up a prophet like you from among their fellow Israelites. I will put my words in his mouth and he will tell the people everything I commanded him. So there's a direct revelation from God and given directly to, the, to God's people. Apart from direct revelation from God, prophets had a preaching and a teaching ministry. It seems that in times of crisis, God led his people often through direct revelation and message and out to the people. But in times of relative peace, God communicated with his people, it seems, through the schools of the prophets, through preaching and through teaching. The fact that Jesus warns of false prophets and false messiahs shows that these were indeed around in his day and that they would be in our day too. Also, the fact that the Apostle Paul warned about false apostles and about false teachers who were turning whole families, he says, these false teachers are turning whole families away from the truth. That shows us that the prophet's role of teacher is what we should be most aware of today. The Apostle Paul gave a warning to the elders in the Ephesus church regarding false teachers that would come in the future from his time. He said, I know that false teachers like vicious wolves, sounds like he's quoting Jesus Sermon on the Mount. I know that false teachers like vicious wolves will come in among you after I leave. Not sparing the flock. Even some men from your own group will rise up and distort the truth in order to draw a following. Interesting, isn't it? Interesting, but very sad that in that ancient congregation, some people would rise up and distort the truth that the Apostle Paul had preached to them. So false prophets, false messiahs, false apostles, false teachers, how do we recognize them today? Well, the first thing Jesus warns us about is that they will be disguised. Now, this doesn't mean that they'll be wearing a coloured wig and dark glasses. This disguise, their disguise, is that they seem harmless. That's the disguise. They seem harmless. They look like everyone else in the flock. That is, they are not obviously dangerous. Their dangerous nature goes unnoticed because they may be church members, as in Paul's day. As he warned the elders at Ephesus, people will rise up from among you. You know, they may even be retired denominational workers. They may be called brother or sister. They may be called elder or pastor. They may occasionally preach on their favourite subject. And they may even teach a Sabbath school lesson. All of this may give the impression that they are safe and their message is true. But in reality, they are as dangerous as vicious wolves let loose in a flock of sheep. Now, this may sound harsh, but these are Jesus' words. And he said them for a reason. Probably by now you're asking, who are they that this preacher is referring to? Is he going to name names? We'll come to that shortly. Scripture is clear that the plan of salvation was put in place so that as many people as possible can be saved eternally in God's kingdom. 
The great controversy between God and Satan has always been over salvation. That's why Jesus warns of deceptions that come right after his call to enter God's kingdom through the narrow gate in the Sermon on the Mount. The controversy today that we call the Great Controversy is the same as it's always been. Today, the Great Controversy is over your salvation and mine. God wants us to be saved and does everything he possibly can so that we can experience that. The devil wants to separate us from God's saving grace and he does all he can to affect that. By their very nature, deceptions are very subtle. They have to be or else they wouldn't deceive anybody. Thankfully, though, Jesus assures us that these disguised people can be identified. And there are ways that we can identify them. Look at verse 16 of our sermon passage again, and then verse 20. Verse 16 says, you can identify them by their fruit, that is, by the way they act. Can you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? And then verse 20. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. What did Jesus mean by the way they act or by their actions? Another way we could say the same thing is you can identify them by what they do and what they say. We could also put it this way. You can identify them by how they behave in the fellowship and what they teach. It's important to examine what people teach because according to the Apostle Paul, subtle falsehood spreads like cancer and turns people away from the faith. Have a look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, 16 and 18. Not now, but when you get time. Sadly, you may know some people, as I do, who have lost their faith altogether after being embroiled in some issue for an extended period of time. Now, with the understanding that the great controversy between God and Satan continues to rage, the devil wants us to forget that, but it continues to rage, and that we are all involved, what is the greatest and most subtle deception that human beings seem so easily to fall prey to? I suggest to you that the greatest, the most subtle deception is to look to yourself rather than looking to our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. If there is one thing that the devil is desperate to do, it's to get you to take your eyes off Jesus. He doesn't care where you look, at each other, people outside the church. He doesn't care where you look as long as you take your eyes off. Of Jesus and no wonder he wants us to remove our gaze from Jesus because when we look at Jesus we see love and forgiveness and acceptance and assurance and empowerment empowering grace and salvation full and free we see all the things that draw us to him and enable us to choose him continually the Bible is abundantly clear that there is salvation in no one else. It's entirely possible, however, that there is that a Christian can start off in the right direction and somewhere along the way get sidetracked. The spiritual journey can begin with the noblest of intentions, but can end with the most critical spirit. What happens? 
Often, people have fallen prey to the devil's biggest deception. They have taken their eyes off Jesus and looked to themselves. Now, one of the most common results of the biggest deception, one that the Apostle Paul had to constantly battle in the early churches, is a subtle form of legalism. Legalism, in the Christian vocabulary, is where a Christian comes to believe that human effort or achievement somehow contributes to their salvation. If you ever get to the stage where you say to yourself, I won't be saved unless I do this or unless I do that, beware the devil's biggest deception. Other people too, even those who you might consider to be well informed theologically, may all urge you to do this or to do that in order to be saved. Beware the devil's biggest deception. Of alarming frequency within Adventism is heard the declaration that in the last days, just before Jesus returns, everyone who will be saved will be living perfectly sinless lives. That is, they will not sin at all in thought, word, or deed. This is a teaching called Last Generation Theology, whose promoters are indeed regular church members, retired denominational workers, and even some who are currently engaged in pastoral ministry. Is this where we start to name names? No. You see, it's not a matter of naming names. It's a matter of testing the message. We must always remember that. It's a matter of testing the message. And as Jesus said, we will know the truth if we apply the fruit test. We must ask, what is the ultimate fruit of the message? Now, sadly, I would say even tragically, last generation theology has destroyed the faith of many sincere and enthusiastic but unsuspecting believers. Here's the danger. Here is why such a teaching, as Paul said, turns people away from the faith. First, it's emphasised that God requires the last generation on earth to live sinless lives. Then it's impressed upon people that we are in fact living in the last days of earth's history and so we could well be the last generation. So having set the standard of sinlessness, often using out-of-context texts such as Matthew 5 and verse 48, and then having given the sense of urgency, as in the shortness of time, the fruit of this tree is often loss of assurance of salvation in Jesus. Why is this usually the fruit simply because last generation theology tends to remove our focus from Jesus to ourselves. How am I doing in these perfection stakes, knowing that it's the last days and I need to be perfect? What do I need to do? Notice the I and the human works. What must I, what do I need to do that I can be made perfect? What do, things do I need to overcome to be eligible for the kingdom? No matter how often we're told that it's Jesus that works in us in our Christian development, we still ask those questions that focus on ourselves. And we still make our mental lists of things to overcome. And we still become anxious and uncertain when we think or speak or do act in a way that is less than perfect. 
Why do I pick on last generation theology with its legalistic call to sinless perfection? Well, I do it for a number of reasons. One, the Bible doesn't teach about a last generation who will not be saved unless they're sinless. Two, because as I have said, this teaching encourages us to take our eyes off Jesus and look to self. Three, it's a part of the devil's greatest deception that the Apostle Paul battled against in the Galatian church when he said, how foolish can you be? After starting your Christian lives in the Spirit, you are now trying to become perfect by your own human effort. You see, it's nothing new. And four, I speak against this false teaching because many years ago it almost made shipwreck of my own faith. Perhaps sometimes, even as Christians, we need to remind ourselves that salvation is a gift from God. Not something that we earn by obedience or deserve because of achievement. Scripture couldn't be any plainer, any cleaner, clearer or any more emphatic than the declaration of Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. But let me anticipate an objection. It's an objection that has been raised many times in conversations that I have had with people. And it goes like this. Well, OK, it's fine to read and quote Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9. But you must read the next verse as well, because that's where Paul speaks about the works that we should do. So then, let's read Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, the next verse, which says, For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus, so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Now from this verse, we can affirm indeed that good works are important in the Christian's life. We can also strongly affirm that the good works that this verse speaks of have no saving merit whatsoever. Let's look a little closer at Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. Did you notice that we are created in Christ Jesus for good works? What does it mean? to be created in Christ Jesus. Well, when Adam and Eve were created, it was intended that their lives be lives of good works. But they sold out to the devil and uh, sin infected all people. But now we are created anew in Christ Jesus. And as he works in our lives, he enables us to do the good works that God originally intended we do. But notice, the good works are a result of being created anew or of being born again in Christ Jesus. We can see then that these verses are placed in this order for a purpose. They are saying that salvation is not through works, but the result of salvation is works. Not works calculated to earn salvation or to repay God for saving us, but works of gratitude and reciprocal love to God. Now that is, as the Bible makes clear, we love God and we work for him because he first loved us and worked for our salvation. But let's go back to our sermon passage. And notice something very significant there. In verse 15, Jesus warns us to beware the dangerous, dangerous teachings of false prophets. Then for the next five verses, he emphasizes our need to look at the fruit. Look at the fruit. Look at the fruit. 
That is, to look at the results of the messages. What is the fruit of a false message? Jesus is not just saying that we have the ability to identify bad fruit from a bad tree. He is saying we must identify false teachings because to be ignorant is to be in danger of being deceived. Jesus said that this danger of losing faith is as dangerous as a vicious wolf is among the sheep. This is why whatever we are presented with as far as the way to salvation is concerned, it is best to look for the right fruit. We can discover the fruit of any message concerning salvation and therefore its trustworthiness, its truthfulness, by asking some simple probing questions such as these. Does this message draw me closer to Jesus or does it make me feel worthless and fearful? Do I feel safe and secure in Jesus because of this teaching? Or does it make me feel that I am unworthy of God's salvation gift? Does this message help me to understand more clearly God's unconditional love and complete forgiveness? Or does it make me just focus on my shortcomings? Does this teaching give me assurance of salvation in Jesus Christ right here, right now? Or does it make me wonder if I'm ready to meet Jesus because of my mistakes? Does the message make me feel settled and confident in my relationship with Jesus? Or does it make me fearful of the future? Does the message cause me to rejoice because what God has done for me? Or does it make me question if I'm really a Christian? The challenge to each one of us today, as it will be again tomorrow, and the day after, the day after that, the challenge is to look to Jesus, our Saviour, who has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God in heaven. He is the author and the finisher of our faith, and he is everything in between. Keep your eyes on Jesus and beware the devil's biggest deception to remove your eyes from Jesus and look to self. Bless you each one. Have a good rest of the Sabbath day. Let me pray for us. Loving Father, we thank you again for the clear message of Scripture. There's the warning that there will be falsehoods. And I guess the closer we do come to the end of time, the more we can expect that. And as the Apostle Paul said, it can come from places where we least expect. Help us, each one, to look for the fruit. Choose the good fruit. Ask the questions. And stay close to Jesus. We pray, Lord, that you would enable us to keep our eyes firmly fixed on you. And we praise you for the wonderful promises of the kingdom. Bless us, each one. We ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thanks, everybody, for listening, and we will see you next week. Bye.